The hallway smelled like warm dust and hot metal, the scent of a machine thinking in coils and vacuum lungs. In that corridor at IBM's laboratory in Poughkeepsie, men and women carried stacks of punched cards like librarians hauling chapters of a book that had not yet learned to speak. On one of those gray mornings, a quiet rebel named John Backus stood with a simple heretical claim in his pocket. He believed that mathematics could be written once in something that looked like human thought and then be translated into the lightning dialect of the machine without losing its soul. He called the dream formula translation. The rest of us would learn to whisper it as Fortran. The world did not make it easy. The IBM 704 was a creature of iron memory and temperamental vowels. Assembly language was the cathedral and the cage. The programmers who worshipped there had calloused minds from counting opcodes like rosary beads. They looked at Bacchus the way fishermen look at a man who swears the river will fillet the trout for you. But Bacchus was not alone. He gathered a peculiar team whose names deserve to be set one by one, like type into the record of our craft, Lois Hyde, who would become a legend for cool analysis under heat. David Sayer, a crystallographer who later etched his mind into the mathematics of X-ray diffraction. Peter Sheridan and Roy Nutt and Robert Nelson, steady hands on turbulent seas. Richard Goldberg and Irving Ziller, Sheldon Best, and Harlan Herrick, a patient engineer who helped coax the first true programs in this new tongue into motion. They were young, serious, and stubborn, and they began to do a kind of magic that would later be filed dutifully under compiler theory. To the outside world, a compiler is a translator. To the inside world, a compiler is a courtroom where every algebraic expression must be cross-examined, where loops are interrogated for their secrets, where common sub-expressions are squeezed like sponges to see if they drip the same constant again. The early Fortran compiler did not merely translate. It promised something audacious, that the code it produced would run within a hair's breadth of the speed of hand-tooled assembly. It made that promise and then, with a kind of midnight fury, kept it. That is why Fortran was not only a language. It was the first great peace treaty between human clarity and machine hunger. The syntax looked like a telegram from a mathematician who had slept too little. Arithmetic if. Computed Goto, variables named from a primordial alphabet in which I through N suggested integers because of old habits from classrooms where the chalk dust rose in thin clouds. Format lines that read like stage directions for numbers, common blocks and equivalents that let you fold memory the way a tailor creases cloth. These influences did not fall from the sky. They came from mathematicians who had been trained to live inside matrices and polynomials, people whose minds had been tuned by the same music that played in the halls of Columbia University and the Institute for Advanced Study. What Bacchus and his team really did in those rooms where the fluorescent lights hummed like bees, was to square up to psychology. Human memory, as the psychologist George Miller argued in his famous paper from the 1950s, is bounded by a handful of chunks. Assembly language demanded that you juggle too many delicate knives at once. Fortran let you group a circus of knives into a single sheath called a formula. That is a kindness. And kindness in computing is not sentiment. It is survival. Of course, there were devils in the commas. Somewhere, a programmer typed a period where a comma belonged and turned a loop of 10 steps into an assignment that marched only once. The story mutated and attached itself to the Mariner spacecraft like a folk curse. But the real tragedy of that lost machine had its roots in a missing bar in a formula, not a Fortran quirk. That is how legends work in our field. They travel like rumors through the ductwork, gaining teeth as they move, the truth is more useful. The truth is that Fortran taught us that languages could be rigorous and still feel like chalk in the hand, that compilers could be both loyal and cunning. The ripples were immediate. In the laboratories at Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore, in the offices of the National Weather Service, in the basement rooms where oil companies ran their reservoir simulations, the new language took hold like ivy on an old wall. Engineers who had written thermodynamics in pencil could now declare it to a machine in something that, if not quite Latin, was at least a cousin to the mathematics they trusted. The first great numerical libraries, the ones whose names are whispered with respect by anyone who has kissed the forehead of a partial differential equation, were born in this cradle, 
LINPAC, LAPAC, the basic linear algebra subprograms, which we call BLAS, as if singing a single syllable would make the algebra sprint. Jack Dongara, a craftsman of numerical bricks and mortar, would spend decades refining these structures and the world's most powerful computers would prove their strength by solving systems that those libraries described. When Dongara received the Turing Award in the decade of the 2000s, it was also a nod to the language that held those libraries together like bone. Time moved, and the standards marched with it. There was the early era that some called Fortran II and Fortran IV, then the formal standard in the late 1960s that placed a seal on what had been happening in the wild. In the late 1970s came Fortran 77, an austere and disciplined uncle of a language that spread into universities like Ivy into Brick. It introduced structured habits that politely asked spaghetti to leave the kitchen. Then came Fortran 90, with modules and array notation that read like sheet music, with derived types that let you build data like organs in a living body, with pointers, and a new respect for the careful work of abstraction, Fortran 95 tidied and sharpened. Fortran 2008, and later Fortran 2018, ventured into parallel worlds and core arrays and the civilizing of concurrency, where teams of processes speak not in shouts, but in careful signals. The most recent standard in the decade of the 2000s built on these pillars, bringing generics and refinements that recognize the reality of modern code bases, where object orientation is not a fad, but a tool, and where numerical work happens on a planet-sized stage of clusters and accelerators. If you trace the lineage, you see a long river trying always to flow like mathematics while cutting a deeper channel for speed. Speed was never an accident. The work of Francis E. Allen at IBM, together with John Koch, taught compilers to read the skeleton of a program as a graph of decisions and loops, to reason about where time was truly spent to transform code without breaking its bones. Allen's Turing Award was more than a medal. It was the profession acknowledging that optimization is not a parlor trick. It is the oil in the engine that moves weather forecasts forward by precious hours and makes a climate model stop screaming and start singing. If you have ever watched clouds move across a satellite image, you have watched Fortran at work. The European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts runs models whose ancestry speaks this language. The weather research and forecasting model, which many universities and agencies adopt, is written in a modern dialect of Fortran. In oceanography, the modular ocean model, the Proudman Oceanographic Laboratory Code, the frameworks at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, they all share a family resemblance. The Earth is a system of coupled equations. And Fortran is the old engineer who still knows how the pipes run under the floor. When a climate scientist in Cambridge or Cape Town runs a simulation that predicts a heat wave a week early, there is a line of Fortran somewhere helping the sun's arithmetic make sense. People like to ask why this ancestor still breathes. They point at languages that came later with more glitter on their cuffs. And they ask in a voice that is too loud why Fortran remains in the rooms with the very large machines that eat megawatts for breakfast. The answer is in the math. Array syntax that reads like the equations on the page lowers the mental friction for the scientist. The compilers are the descendants of warriors who have spent decades learning to peel loops like onions and feed vector units with perfect regularity. When you have to solve a Poisson equation across a billion cells, you want a language that has grown old in the service of linear algebra, not a language that is just learning the names of the streets. Think of a supercomputer at Oak Ridge or Argon, those rooms that sound like distant rain. On the exascale systems with names that feel like prophecy, material science codes in Fortran map the electron densities of alloys that will sheath the engines of the next generation. Astrophysical codes in Fortran sculpt galaxies in numerical clay, then let gravity, that great critic, smooth the edges. Seismology codes in Fortran shake a digital earth to see which towers will stand, which bridges will need thicker tendons. In those simulations, the language becomes a moral instrument. It tells us where to evacuate, which levy to reinforce, which policy to draft. The south-facing window in your apartment is not accidental. Somewhere, heat load models made by Fortran helped write building codes that let old neighborhoods survive new summers. The corporate world learned the same lesson. 
oil and gas firms, whatever you think of their ethics or their future, built geophysical codes in Fortran that let them see through stone. Aerospace companies used Fortran to test wings that had not yet been, been carved. NASA asked Fortran to fly ahead, simulating dynamics before metal met sky. The language earned a reputation that is not romantic, only reliable. Reliable is the most beautiful compliment in engineering. There is a romance though, if you look for it. Fortran is a river that has cut canyons in our intellectual geology. It taught the world that a high level language was not a toy. It gave permission for other languages to exist. Algol borrowed its courage. Kobol borrowed its stance. That clarity matters to people who do not speak binary. Even the feuds of the 1960s, the algorithmic theology that spawned Bacchus Nauer form and the rigorous grammars of language design trace back to a time when Fortran insisted that the machine learn our songs. Without that insistence, the history of programming might be a hallway of infinite toggles. Fortran kept some awkward turns of phrase, the way a beloved uncle keeps an accent after decades in a new country. The commas and labels of the early days trained a generation to think in jumps that later pedagogy tried to unteach. The culture around Fortran sometimes hid behind legacy. There were years when object orientation arrived, like a new religion, and the old believers argued in the churchyard. Yet the language learned. It grew modules and interfaces and type-bound procedures. It learned to speak to C and to GPUs. It built a package manager, not as flashy as others, but solid. It kept adding the features that numerical people need without letting go of the idea that a matrix expression on the page ought to look like a matrix expression in code. Critics point out the limits. Practitioners answer with results. But the untold part of this story is not about features. It is about the way Fortran bent reality. On a planet that grows more crowded and more precarious, prediction is the slender rope we use to cross ravines. Fortran's greatest gift is prediction at scale. It takes the differential equations that describe air and water and rock and lets them act on digital continents. It turns yesterday's weather into tomorrow's evacuation plan. It turns a chemist's hypothesis into a spectrum that decides whether a drug moves forward or dies. It turns a policymaker's spreadsheet into evidence. The thing that once lived on the IBM 704 has become a distributed conscience. John Backus won the Turing Award for a lifetime of ideas. And in his famous lecture, he asked if we could liberate programming from the style of the von Neumann machine. On first reading, that sounds like a critique of Fortran, the language that married itself to the architecture of its time. But perhaps there is a softer reading. Fortran was the first jailbreak. It took the instruction counter and wrapped it in algebra. It stopped asking the human to be a perfect clerk and let the human be a mathematician, a scientist, a person who could hold models of the world in the mind without being crushed by the gears. Liberation is never once. It is a sequence of small mercies. If you walk today into a lab at Yorktown Heights or a weather center outside Reading, if you drift through the corridors of a national lab where the security man nods at your badge and the air tastes faintly of ozone, you will meet Fortran the way a child meets the old tree in the yard. You will not be told it is important. You will notice that the ground stays put around it. You will see that bird nests and cables both find purchase in its branches. You will grow up under it without thinking that someone planted it in the last century with a shovel made of hope. Fortran's story is not over. It has learned to cooperate with Python on the surface and to speak to C and CUDA under it. It appears in hybrid codes where kernels of linear algebra blaze in Fortran while orchestration happens elsewhere. It is, to borrow a phrase from ecology, a keystone species. Remove it and entire habitats of practice collapse. Keep it healthy and whole fields continue to hunt and gather knowledge. There is a line I carry from the early manuals, though manuals are rarely poetic. It is the quiet conviction that a formula written cleanly should not have to apologize to the machine. That idea, once planted, changed the way we design languages, the way we teach undergraduates, the way we build software companies that trade in abstractions rather than registers. It changed how scientists write papers, because the code that generated the figure can be read by peers who think in algebra, not opcodes. 
It changed how agencies justified budgets because simulations are persuasive and persuasion is policy. It changed how we meet the earth because models give us a way to argue with the future before the future arrives. Some nights when the building has emptied and the monitors blink like patient eyes, a Fortran program runs in the dark. It takes wind over water and turns it into a storm track. It takes friction in a steel lattice and turns it into a fatigue curve. It takes the hint of a molecule and turns it into a possible cure. The fans breathe. The floor vibrates. Somewhere far away, a farmer will sleep in a house that will not flood because a model screamed in time and the civil engineers took the scream seriously. Somewhere closer, a student opens an old textbook and sees a line of Fortran that looks suspiciously like the equation on the previous page, and something clicks. This is how craft becomes culture. When we speak about human progress, we often tell the story of devices you can hold. The phone that dissolves an hour, the car that hums instead of growls, but languages are devices too. Fortran is one of the oldest and most faithful. It is not a relic, it is a river. It carved the channel in which numerics flows. It is not always beautiful, but it is fierce where it matters. It is believed, for longer than most of us have been alive, that the thoughts of scientists deserve to run as fast as the machine will allow. And so, in laboratories and forecasting centers and quiet rooms with loud computers, the untold story of Fortran continues, line after line, equation after equation, as the planet asks a hard question and we answer imperfectly with code.